Welcome to the Fit Rich Life Podcast, a show where we talk about money, entrepreneurship, health and fitness, and building a life you absolutely love. What if you could take a six-month mini retirement on your way to achieving financial independence? Well, in today's special guest interview, I get to chat with Lauren and Stephen Keyes from Trip of a Lifestyle who vacationed their way to over a $1 million net worth. This included a six-month honeymoon trip to Hawaii, a seven-month trip to visit every single national park in the U.S., a three-month trip to Australia, and a bunch more extended trips. In this episode, here are some things you will learn. One, how Lauren and Steven took all these incredible mini retirement trips on their way to financial independence. Two, takeaway strategies that you can use for money, work, and travel. Three, how they were able to achieve financial independence and millionaire status by age 33. Four, how they invest and how they use credit card bonuses to invest even more. We cover a bunch of stuff in the show, and it's truly a great one for anyone interested in living an unconventional and truly adventurous lifestyle. The insight, strategies, and wisdom Lauren and Stephen share in this episode will empower you with your own money and life journey. Please enjoy a wide-ranging conversation with Lauren and Stephen Keyes from Trip of a Lifestyle. All right, we got Lauren and Stephen Keyes from Trip of a Lifestyle, and the two of them vacationed their way to over a million dollar net worth, including a six-month Hawaii trip, a seven-month trip visiting every single national park in the U.S., a three-month Australia trip, and several others. But before we dive into that story, tell me about how you used ramen noodles to purchase a car that you needed for a particular trip. So this this goes way back to 2015. Uh, we were taking a six month vacation to Hawaii, which we had never been to, and we did not plan well at all. Which is a whole nother story on its own. But uh, bottom line is, we were, we were going to be there for six months, and it's an island, so we were going to need a car, and we couldn't bring ours with us. So we found a car on Craigslist, nice little uh, 2000 Mazda Miata convertible perfect for the two of us on an island and we were ready to buy it but we did not think ahead at all we were not very good planners and we still aren't very good planners um so we realized we did not have cash to pay for the car like we had the money in our bank account obviously but we didn't have cash so we negotiated this price with this person and we were like uh how can we pay you could we like paypal you or like write you a check or like do like any number of modern ways to pay. And they're like, no, cash only. Like, I don't want any scams or anything like that. So we're like, okay, well, I guess we have to go get cash then. And they were like, this price you negotiated on, it's today only. Like, you better get this cash today. I was like, all right, sounds good. So we tried to figure out ways to get cash. I mean, we tried a couple of things. Yeah, right? we like went to the ATM, obviously, and just tried to withdraw the total for the car i think it was like what four thousand dollars forty five hundred and we had like a couple hundred bucks on us yeah and i think the like daily withdrawal limits like a thousand dollars per person or something and so like that only got us halfway there and we were like okay how do we get other money than just this because this is only half we were calling our bank like can you increase the limit and by the way it was the fourth of july so every bank is closed and in hawaii they don't have any mainland banks so our bank doesn't even exist there even if they were open so yeah uh ended up ended so up i was a- like i think like can't you get cash back on your debit card at the grocery store like the safeway is open what if we just like bought something and like saw what the cash back was i don't know what the limit is on that but like it's money we could try and i said this is never gonna work there's zero percent chance of this working whatsoever but she was like yeah no no no, we have to try it she's like eternal optimist about everything he's like we'll try it we'll try it so we go in line uh we get we're like get the cheapest thing we like get a pack of ramen noodles and we go through the line and the cash back limit per transaction is like two hundred dollars so we're like run it through they give us the cash and we're like can we just like is there can you we keep do like how do we get the rest of the money like do we keep 
going through. So Steve and I would go through separate checkout lines, each with a pack of ramen noodles and get $200 until we had the rest of the 2500 bucks. And we were trying to kind of be like shady and like go to different <laughs> checkout lines each time and like alternate so they wouldn't notice. But like, is this a new cashier? Like, let's cr- try someone else. And they, they, at one point, they had to like go back in the safe and bring more money out to one of the registers that we apparently depleted. And like, when they went back to the safe to ask the manager to open the safe, I was like, it's over for us. <laughs> we're There's done. no way. We're like, cooked. we were only like halfway to the money that we needed. And we had extracted like, two grand from this Safeway. We, we started calling it the Bank of Safeway. <laughs> yeah. And we had we had extracted a couple thousand dollars and they were like, I have to go back to the safe to get more. I was like, there's no way the manager is going to like be cool with this. And they just went and got a stack of cash, filled up the cash register and just kept giving us money. And so we were able to get all the cash we needed for the Miata same day, 4th of July, thanks to the Bank of Safeway and packs of ramen noodles. Uh, and we had plenty of ramen noodles to eat for, for groceries. <laughs> <Yeah>. so. <laughs> awesome. Well, I love that story because of the the optimism and the ingenuity to like figure it out, especially on 4th of July. Because I think most people just like give up. Um, and that sense of optimism, ingenuity, I think plays a huge role in your story. So I kind of want to wind back in uh time and and dive deeper into that first trip to hawaii because you know you guys have reached the million dollar plus net worth and you've taken all these like multi-month trips along the way but that very first trip i believe you only had around like a hundred thousand or so like saved and i just want to know like How did you come up with this dream? How did you implement the dream? Like what gave you the courage? So like take us through that first like six month trip to Hawaii. Yeah. uh, So what prompted that trip was uh, we were both working full time. I was a public school teacher. I was working in marketing for a small financial company. I was like a one woman marketing team. (laughs) So we were making about like 40 grand a year each in salary. And we were just living as as frugally as possible um, around like the Orlando, Florida area. And we were able to get our expenses down to like $22,000 a year, something like that combined for the both of us. And we were renting like that includes rent at this at this point. Um, So our expenses were pretty low. That enabled us to save a lot. So we were saving upwards of 60% of our income, even on like $40,000 salaries. Um, and that's where we got that hundred thousand dollars you talked about. We actually saved about a hundred thousand dollars in two years of doing that with our low expenses, leaving us with a net worth closer to like one fifty k. And we were like, "All right, dude, like we're kind of burned out, like working full time and doing like side hustles and stuff." For- we were doing like everything at that time because it was like early on, and we were tracking our net worth. We were seeing the number tick up, and we we're like, anything to get that number to move is huge. And so we're like doing photography on the weekends, we're buying and selling random stuff that we'd find. We're like, sweet, this like coffee table on a curb, let's flip it. Like we were doing everything. And so we were like pretty, we were pretty ready to, for a break. And so we got, we got married during that time period. And because Stephen was a school teacher, we were like, well, it doesn't really make sense to like, for him to take a whole week off in the middle of the school year. Like, what if we just push it to the summer? and did something like better because we're really over this whole working thing anyway. So we we, we realized like, hey, if you have $150,000 net worth and you have $22,000 a year expenses, like you have upwards of like seven years of expenses saved up. You know, even though 150K doesn't sound like a lot of money for us, it was a ton of money because our living expenses were so low. Um, so we're like, hey, you know, with that much buffer in the bank, like, what if we just quit our jobs? What if we just quit and go do something for a long time and take a real break, something that will actually recharge us, not just like a week that we have to spend $3,000 on for a honeymoon or whatever. So we called this Hawaii trip our honeymoon, but in reality, it was a six-month sabbatical, sabbatical <laughs> right, from work. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it was just awesome. We We ended up moving to Hawaii. We actually figured out that we could keep our expenses about the same as they were in Orlando. We were actually still spending like 22 K a year or something like that in Hawaii to live. Uh, we bought that cheap used car, which great car, super fun car. And then we ended up selling the ramen noodle car, by the way, for $5,600, which was 1100 more than we paid for it on that six month vacation. So we just did it cheap. 
And we ended up coming coming back home with the same net worth that we left with. And, and we kind of just discovered this life hack of like, wow, you can take months off of work and it doesn't like cost you any of your savings. And we ended up doing that again and again after that. One of the keys to that though was when we went to, um, when we went to leave, uh, I, I didn't actually fully quit my job. I talked to them about doing some work for them while in Hawaii, um, doing a little bit of remote work. I think I negotiated it about 10 hours a week. And that amount of work, plus Stephen doing like, again, little random side hustle things, photography, tutoring, was enough to cover those low expenses that we had while we were there. And so that was really a huge part of why we were able to come home, not just the ramen noodle car profit, but why we, how we were able to come home with our savings intact. Yeah. I love it. Couple questions. So you worked for two to three years before going on this first Hawaii trip or? Yeah. So after graduating college, we worked full time for about two years um, and saved an additional hundred and I think $106,000 or something like that in those two years at our first like out of college adult jobs or whatever. Um, yeah. And then we left for Hawaii. And then when you're in Hawaii, it sounds like both of you are doing sort of like part time work to kind of essentially fund uh, this six month sabbatical slash honeymoon. Um, how much like how 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 many hours per week were you actually working on, you know, on average? About 10 each. Um, and since our living expenses were twenty two thousand a year combined. What that basically means is our whole six month Hawaii trip cost about eleven thousand dollars in total. Like the net cost of the trip was eleven thousand dollars. So I mean, think about you know how little work really it can take to earn eleven thousand dollars. It's not that big of between a deal. two people. Like um, so, yeah, we were working like maybe ten hours a week, something like that at the time. I love it. And so after you came back from that six month sabbatical honeymoon etc would you recharge because you mentioned that you were like super burned out kind of like you know grinding pretty hard to get that you know first uh 100k plus i i think we were super excited to go back to work and to earn more because we had just kind of realized like whoa like a little bit of savings in the bank is what kind of emboldened us to do that and so if we could just like put away a little more money or feeling pretty relaxed right now, let's go get a couple more jobs and and put away some more money. I mean, we'll have like unlimited freedom at some point. And so we kind of set our sights on the traditional like 25 X expenses that we wanted to save up eventually. And yeah, we got back to work. We actually ended up uh, moving to an even lower cost of living area, um, Gainesville, Florida, which was our college town. And we immediately, upon coming back from Hawaii, we bought our first home in cash. It was uh, just a modest condo, it was $71,000. Um, so we just paid for that in cash. Then our living expenses were got as low as like $18,000 a year. And we ended up job hopping to new jobs, new town. Um, and we both ended up getting significant pay increases from, from where we were. And the, that pay scale went up and up and up. Um, as we lived in Gainesville and saved more. Yeah, I would say that the that the trip was really something that Hawaii trip was kind of a proof of concept. It was, um, you know, we call it our honeymoon, but it was also like a mini retirement. We weren't really working anymore. We didn't go into an office. And it really did feel like, oh, this is like what the point of all this money is for is to be able to have the super relaxed lifestyle where I don't even have to think or worry about money and I can wake up every day, look at my list of things that I want to explore on the fridge and pick one and go do it. Like that was what every day was like in Hawaii. And we were like, yeah, I definitely want this in the future. So like, let's get back to work and like get there. Um, so it definitely was recharging, re-energizing to like have that break and like really know what we were working toward. It was definitely a proof of concept. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is like, it was essentially like a dry run of financial independence, retire early. And you were like, this is what we want. And it gave you that energy and the inspiration to like continue to work towards that in the most like efficient way possible. But 
in my kind of research in preparation for this, I think one of the things that I really admire about both of you is like, this wasn't like deprivation or frugaling yourself into a corner, but you actually really had a lot of fun along the way. So can you share a little bit more? Like, how did you have that mindset? Because, you know, Compared to your peers, you're spending so much less than everybody else. I think we both have the perspective coming out of college that like our life is fun. In co- like in college, you're have everybody always says like, "Oh, you're having the most fun of your entire life," right? But everybody also says when they're in college, like, "Oh, you're eating a ramen noodle <laughs> diet and you don't spend money and you're so you know frugal and you have to be cheap about everything." Well, if those two things can be true at the same time, that your spending is ultra low and you're super frugal and you're having the best time of your life, why change anything? Like you you don't really need to change your lifestyle that much. And so we just took the perspective of like, we were happy and enjoying ourselves in college, going outside, going for bike rides, hanging out with friends, playing games, like just doing cheap, fun stuff. We had no reason to want to upgrade, right? We didn't really want any of the stuff that increased spending could buy us. So you're right. Like we didn't really feel super deprived because of that mindset. And I think, again, that trip to Hawaii, realizing like we could take six months and go vacation for that entire time and not backtrack on our goals was like also uh, emboldening. Like we were like, wow, anytime we feel like, you know, it's easy to fall into the like, got to work hard. You see the numbers tick up. It's encouraging. And so you, you know, nose to the grindstone, you got to get through it. But we were like, you know, every time you come up for air, it doesn't have to cost you anything. Look at this Hawaii trip. We can just peace out for six months and nothing bad happens. Like that, it actually is just a better, we're in a better position now. Like, so I think that trip encouraged us to take future trips. And that was kind of what started the mind like that mindset of like oh we'll just like bake this whole travel thing in because it doesn't actually cost us much of anything i love it so tell us about the next trip uh you know how long were you working before you took the next trip like did you get burned out again and we're like oh we need another mini retirement on our way to financial independence how did that work out so, definitely agree that it was another case of burnout. <laughs> for sure. Definitely burned out on working too much. But uh, And by working too much, we mean working full time. That's too much. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, after Hawaii, you know, we moved to Gainesville. We bought that condo uh, and then we got new jobs. We worked full time again after that for like somewhere between three and four years. Um, and we increased our pay scale too. So, you know, pre Hawaii, we were making about 40K a year per person. Uh, Post Hawaii, we started out at, I think, like 50 and 70,000 per person. And we scaled that up to like 80 and 90 per person by the time we were done in Gainesville, <laughs> which is where that next trip comes into play. So we got our savings rate up to like, 80 plus percent during this period because our living expenses actually went down from from having a paid off home and not having rent anymore um so we saved a ton more money and by the time we were at like i want to say like roughly half a million maybe six hundred thousand dollars something like that net worth we took that next trip yes because we were burned out and just tired of working so much and so this time you know we looked back and we're like well lauren negotiated that like part-time deal with her previous employer for like 10 hours a week or whatever in Hawaii. What if we kind of just try that strategy again? Just like we're prepared to leave and just quit our jobs if necessary. But what if we try that strategy again really quick? So we both kind of told our employers like, Hey, we're going on a trip. And by the way, the trip was, we decided to take seven months and we wanted to visit every national park in the United States. So I think there were 59 or 60 of them at the time. And then they ended up adding more on us. But anyway. While we were on the trip, they're like, new park. And we're like, got to plan that. (laughs) Got to add that to the list. So so we both went to our employers at the time and just said, hey, we're going on this trip. We're taking seven months. We're going to go to every national park. We already bought a camper van. It's happening. Uh, We could quit. Like, that's a thing. But, you know, if you don't want to lose us as employees, like we're open to the idea of like working a little bit part time on the road, maybe even coming back afterward. Like 
let us know what you think. Like, but if not, you know, we quit. Um, and they both, both of our employers entertain the idea. Um, mine actually came back with a really good offer for part-time work on the road. It actually ended up being a higher hourly rate than I was making as a full-time employee just for way, way less hours. It was more like 10 hours a week, maybe. Um, and then Lauren's employer. I did not have as great of a negotiation process. Um, but you know, it, we, we parted amicably. They just like, they really want people in the office. They were not very open to remote work at that time. This was 2018. And so at the end of 2018, I just quit. And then in 2019 in January is when we like set off on the road to all the parks. So, um, yeah, we, we parted on good terms, but it was just not like the best. I was like, eh, I can, we're, we're good. <laughs> yeah. So seven months visiting every single national park. How, like, how did you actually map that out? Like, how did that actually work out? Like, were you sleeping in hotels, sleeping in your car? Like, walk us through some of the nuance of like making that dream trip a reality. So we, Stephen kind of alluded to the fact that we had a camper van, um, but it was not like the, the fancy like sprinter build out Instagram worthy vans that you see. It is a Nissan NV200. It's a compact cargo van meant for like city deliveries. Um, it's just big enough in the back for a full size bed. Um, and so we built like a little platform that we could access for storage underneath um put the bed on top and that was our camper van and so we it gets really good gas mileage because it's so small it's like for a van anyway it's like 25 miles to the gallon or whatever and that was really important for the fact that we were going to be driving from florida to alaska and everywhere in between um and so do you remember the mileage that we put that 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 trip was i forget honestly i forget the miles it's like it was it was, was it was pretty far um but there were also some like logistical things to to figure out because for example there are national parks in american samoa hawaii virgin islands and a lot of the parks in alaska are also not accessible by road um and so there were plenty of times where we had to leave the van and fly somewhere and yes stay in a hotel um and there were a couple of nights where uh it got so cold uh in overnight that we had to get a hotel room because um at one point for example the doors to the van froze shut um, I didn't know that that could happen because I'm from Florida <laughs> and I was like, what is going on? Um, so that was kind of like, um, a bit of a rude awakening. They had like a crazy, um, blizzard that time of year. And we like got snowed out several times. We were like, let's take this road. We drive pretty far down like a forest road and find out they stopped plowing it. Um, and we had to just like turn around and come all the way back out. Um, so we had lots of little, um, side quests like that. But yeah, uh, most of the, lo the logistics were more around timing the year, um, the time of year with the park. So like the fact that it, we started in January, staying in the South during January, because everywhere else is frozen still, um, and timing our, our arrival at parks when they would actually have roads plowed. And we did a lot of the tropical parks early because of that, um, needing to like be like we were in death valley for example that's not tropical but it's in the desert hot. it was hot usually in the winter in the winter but we went we were there i think in like february and it was like perfect um and so just like that was more the logistics was really just like the time of year and weather was really the driving factors of where we were and why <laughs> i love it um i'm sure my audience is curious like what were some of your favorite parks on that trip our favorite one really was Death Valley, uh, highly underrated U.S. National Park. Um, so that's in California. It's out in the desert. You'd think there's nothing out there, but there's just so much like diverse landscape out there. There's sand dunes and like really cool geological formations. And then like it's out in the middle of nowhere. So the, the coolest thing is in the middle of the night, the stars are just like unbelievable, like like nothing you've ever seen. It was like being in a planetarium. Like it was, it, it, it's full visibility. I think they're like a designated dark sky park too. So like definitely a protected area for that. You you can see, I mean, for miles, I feel like the stars in the sky. Um, that was one of our favorite favorites. Um, 
I mean, I think we rank the Hawaii parks pretty highly too. Yeah. Um, just because they're like unique um, to visit. We actually have a blog post that we did where we ranked them all one through now there's 63 of them. So we did them all in order. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect. We'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, so if people want uh, some cool. uh, ideas for which ones they should visit. Um, I love it. Okay. So got lots of pictures too. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Talk a little bit about some of your side hustles, uh, specifically, um, you know, I read through your blog and, uh, you know, one of the, you know, optimizing income strategies that you had is like develop more skills and monetize them. So I'm just like, can you speak a little bit about how that helped, you know, fund, uh, both your adventure and your living expenses? Yeah, since high school, we've both been interested in photography. So we've run and continue to run on a small basis, uh, professional photography business, just shooting like events and portraits and things like that. And it's just like a fun way to like get out of the house and do something that we both liked anyway. And, And so that was one of our like more fun side hustles. I have always, I mean, I majored in physics and I have a master's degree in education. I've always, um, you know, been interested in teaching. I was a public school teacher. So tutoring was kind of like a natural side hustle for me. And I was like really surprised to see, you know, what kind of hourly rate you could command with just like private one-on-one tutoring. Um, people are really pay- willing to pay very well for that. Uh, I don't really do that anymore. Um on like a one-on-one basis like that, but it was a great side hustle when we were really trying to save super hard. Um, what else? Um, I mean, I did like random social media stuff for folks, um, mostly small businesses. And very often like the company that I worked for previously, like I would reach out, um, and talk to them like before, again, pretty much (laughs) almost every job that I had before I left, like, or while I was trying to like okay, I'm moving away now, I would like offer a menu of services. And like a lot of times I would stay on and do social media work as like a freelancer. But I've also done um, some social media marketing as well for like other small um, charities and small businesses. And like in Hawaii, for example, like a lot of folks um, aren't even on like Google Maps. And it's like a very easy thing to like set that up for somebody. Um, And so we, we, have done that and having like photography as well. It's like really easy to like offer these different services to, to small businesses who need them, who aren't experts in that. We've done some really weird stuff too. Uh, like for example, um, <laughs> you can't say that yeah. and then not immediately explain. I'm going to explain, you know, some of them. So, uh, yeah, like, like one thing that I kind of came up with one time was, uh, you know, coins in the U.S. used to be made out of oh, yeah. silver, right? And I was like, hey, I wonder, like, if you could find old coins, like, from the bank and just sell them for their silver value. So I would ride my bike. This was probably, like, 2016. This was during that like time that. period before Hawaii where we were getting burned. No, this was burned. close away, right after Hawaii. You right were doing Hawaii. this? On- yeah, I it was in Gainesville right after Hawaii. This <laughs> oh, was, like, 2016. Right. So okay. I would ride my bike down to the local bank. And I would be like, hey, uh, I'm going to need like, I don't know, $3,000 <laughs> in half dollars. And the reason I picked half dollars was because half dollars have been out of circulation for a long time, but the banks can still get them. They can still order boxes of them or whatever. So they'd be like, all right, we have to order that for you. I'm like, all right, sounds good. Let me know when they're in. Ride my bike back there, fill my backpack with $3,000 in half dollars, which is really heavy. Bike back home, bust that open. All you do is you look at the sides, the like edge of the coins. If they don't have that copper strip in the middle, it's a silver coin. I ended up finding a whole bunch of silver coins in these like uncirculated, basically old half dollars that no one's touched for a while. Pull out the silver, sell it for the metal content. I think I was making like, I figured out I was making like 30 or $40 30 hour an though. hour net profit, like after acute accounting for all that. And at the time I was like, okay, that's an okay side hustle. <laughs> I probably wouldn't do that now, but I did it for a little while, for like six months or something until I got tired of it. Well, we, and, and We've now, done some other weird stuff too. Well, now um, you just have a little obsession with $2 bills, but if you can find uncirculated, um, serially in order $2 bills, you can sell that as like a, I don't know. You can sell it. I don't know more, why, but you can you sell can. them for more than face value on eBay. So I would okay. go to the bank and I would be like, 
give me five thousand dollars in two dollar bills and then some of them would be uncirculated i'd take those sell them on ebay for like 20 or 30 percent over their face value and then i would just deposit the rest back into the bank right we also got the bank did not like me very much but (laughs) but we also got like in gainesville we got really into um we lived in like our condo was part of a large community and there are lots of college students and so regularly there is move in move out furniture just like left and so we would like hey this is in pretty good shape like let's wipe it down and list it on facebook marketplace and this you know coffee table or bookcase or desk that we found for free and just moved (laughs) we get to make 50 bucks off of or whatever like that was a pretty good deal too yeah and man in the early years we were looking for like any way to just make a little extra cash and it was it was interesting because like a lot of these little side things like I, I would always try to think about it in terms of hourly rate like all right how much time did I really just spend doing that and was it worth it and I was surprised like a lot of the things were like you know from 30 to like hundreds of dollars per hour and I was like okay I'll keep doing that for a little while and one of the things too in Gainesville right like there's not an Ikea the closest Ikea is like two hours away and there are these side tables that are literally like they're called LAC. They're a LAC table is the name of it. And it's just a square top with uh, legs that you screw into it. That's it. That, it's like not fancy. But they you can buy them at Ikea for like 10 or I think when they're on I sale. I think they were 10, 10 bucks at the time. But you could sell it for like $15, $20 on put Craigslist together or on in, in, or- in Gainesville because there's no Ikea and it's already put together for you. And so like, it was a little like arbitrage hack. <laughs> Taking Ikea furniture from a city that has Ikea to a city that doesn't have an Ikea. Putting it together and selling it. 100%. Huge. You can make it. <laughs> it's, that's the takeaway tip for the audience is Ikea arbitrage. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Ikea how, side hustle. That's how we save a million dollars. <laughs> okay. I love this. Again, it's just that like ingenuity and this sense of optimism and just like trying out a bunch of stuff and like uh just the sense of adventure that you're having along this trip like it doesn't sound like you just like sat at home and like tried not to spend any money and you know just worried about trying to make money at your nine to five so post the national park trip it's somewhere 2019 2020 you're somewhere around six hundred thousand dollars in net worth at this time, and then you go back to work again. Walk us through the next, you know, section of work, and then the next, like, you know, mini retirement. So, to be clear, I did not. I didn't go back to work. Oh. <laughs> I, I quit, and I did not know that that was me retiring at the end of 2018. But it was Stephen's part of his negotiation for the National Park trip was that he would return. So, so he kind of had to. I, well, you know, I told my boss, like, yeah, like, I'll be open to coming back full time afterwards. So I came back full time after the trip. Um, that was at the end of 2019, like 29. We got we got back in August of 2019. Yeah. And so so I went back full time. I think I lasted about six more months before I was like, man, we got enough money. Like, uh, <laughs> and it's not worth it. <laughs> I'm good. Um, so I then, you know, let let my employer know again, like, hey, like full time work. It's just not something I want to do anymore, like I, probably ever. So if you want to go back to like the part time type of deal, the contractor based stuff, we can. If this is goodbye, like that's OK, too. And they took me up on, you know, what I was willing to give them. Um, and so I went back to working very part time again, probably like 10 hours a week, something like that. And I've actually maintained some amount of that relationship ever since then. So that company still contracts me to do little amount of work right now, which is just like a nice little extra income stream, even though we're, for the most part, just living that retired life now. So essentially, you've been like work optional since 2019, and you've been in this like post FI quasi working here and there for the last almost five years now yeah? yeah yeah so since each of us were 29 yeah okay yeah and we launched trip of a lifestyle on like our blog on that road trip we were like in the car a lot lots of driving so there were lots of conversations had in that van about like what we want to do and like how come no one else has figured this out yet like this 
why doesn't everyone take a seven month trip to the national parks? Like, like, how is it possible that we're in this van on this seven month vacation and like all our friends and family are like back home, back working. home working full time <laughs> with like no end in sight to that? It doesn't make sense. So, you know, we had tried to like just like talk to individuals or like just post on like our Facebook account about like these strategies that we've been using and stuff. And trust me, all our Facebook friends knew about Steven's corn, uh, coin roll hunting that he was doing, (laughs) but like, you know, there's only a few likes on that post. (laughs) Right. So, so, you know, we're like, we need to find an audience for this because there's gotta be people out there who are are into this or Mm -hmm. who, who would do this. Right. So we, we started this blog, uh, and just started like posting some stuff up on social media and, you know, over the years, we've kept up with it. And it's grown into like a pretty cool community. And I think we've been able to, you know, influence a lot of people and and hopefully change some lives out there. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about investing strategy. um, Before we get too deep into this, just because, you know, you started investing pretty early uh, in your your life, all things considered. And, you know, looking over your essentially 10 year journey to get to a million dollars, there's no way you can save yourself, save your money to that level of wealth. Like you actually have to invest. So, you know, walk us through kind of like how you got into investing and then, you know, what your investing strategy is. So it's, it's interesting, you know, you mentioned that, even still to this day, I think if we were to carefully do the math, the majority of our net worth probably does still come from money that we literally saved from like mm. paychecks and side hustles and stuff like that. But all of that was also getting invested along the way. And so a good chunk of it at this point is for investing. So like an obvious question is like, well, you you took your national parks trip, you had say $600,000, you eventually get to a million. What makes up the difference if you never went back to full-time jobs? big part of that is definitely returns on investment. And then in addition to those, you know, just side hustles and stuff that we've continued to do. So investing is really important. It is a big chunk of that, but saving was even more important getting that Mm. money in the first place. Our investing strategy is really simple, passive, like couldn't be more boring, really. It's just, um, we take all the extra money uh, and by extra money, I just mean whatever we don't spend, whatever we don't spend to live our life take that and invest it into simple index funds like stock and bond market index funds. So tickers being like VTI, VXUS and BND. And then uh, that first condo that we bought for $71,000 has since then actually doubled in value and is now producing $1,780 per month in rent. Um, mortgage free, which is pretty cool too. So that's kind of like a little accidental investment because we don't live there anymore. We ended up moving out to the beach, um, buying a second condo that we're in right now, um, also in cash. So that old one became a rental property for us. So that's our portfolio, just index funds and one rental property. I love it. So were there any key influences in kind of like learning how to invest? You know, I kind of understand like uh, after you finished undergrad, and, you know, I believe you moved to California to go to grad school and then you were getting a stipend, Stephen. And then, Lauren, you were working, I believe, as a secretary and you guys just started to accumulate cash. Like, how did you go from like just saving to like, wait, maybe we should actually do something with this money and get it working for us? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, you're referring to like the really early, the pre-Hawaii years, right? Like right out of college. I did have a, a nine month stint in uh, grad school in California before I dropped out of that program and I ended up doing a master's degree elsewhere. But yeah, during that period, that's when we kind of learned like Lauren had a full time job. You were making what, like 30, low 30s a year, something like that? I guess it was $18 an hour. Yeah. That's, I just, because that was like how it was reported at the time. I wasn't even thinking about it as like a, a salary because my life at that time, I had just graduated college. So it wasn't like, I don't know. I wasn't thinking of it in terms of like my annual salary because I was like working at a front desk. <laughs> and our expenses were a little higher in California. I think we were spending twenty six thousand dollars a year. We had like <laughs> uh, on campus housing, so it was like reasonable for Southern California. Luckily, um, and yeah, I had this like twenty two thousand dollar a year uh, T 
TA stipend for being in this PhD program. And we kind of just saw money start to pile up because we like, like I said, we were spending like 26 K a year. We were making more than that combined money piles up. And you kind of ask yourself as a young person, you know, we were like 22, 23 at the time. Like, what are you supposed to do with extra money? Like what's, what do you, what's the deal with that? And that's where we kind of were really like, we stumbled upon investing, like investing is the thing you do with extra money. Right. So if you don't have debt, you know, pay off your debt first. If, if you don't have debt, invest. So we learned uh, pretty quickly how to invest, uh, made a, a couple small mistakes in the early early stages there. But uh, within the first like year or so, we stumbled upon index fund investing and pretty much stuck with that um, from then on out. Awesome. Okay. So let's transition to my guess for the three-month Australia trip. There was some sort of like leading up credit card strategy to making that trip possible um, at in a way where you once again came back from a, a sabbatical with a higher net worth. Is that correct? So our Australia trip was actually just last year, 2023. Um, and so this is one of many like post fire, post retirement trips that we've had. Um, and really we have done a lot with like the credit card game, uh, the credit card churning thing, but we went a lot harder on it actually in our years when we were working and saving. Cause like back then we just had this mindset of like every like couple hundred bucks that you can stash away is like valuable. Right. And so in those early years, we were signing up for tons and tons of credit cards. We, we signed up for like 40 credit cards in like a six or seven year period. I think in those early years, we and made $20,000 from doing that though. cash like so, so, real money that we received and then could invest so over i mean it's not when you say over six years like okay but it was significant for the amount of work that you have to do to like open a credit card it was pretty good money so we focused on cash back cards and cash sign up bonuses because we were interested in taking that money and investing it a lot of people are focused on travel cards because uh, they say that the redemption value for the points is higher, which in other words means the retail value of like the hotel room or the first class plane ticket or whatever it is you get is higher than the cash you would have gotten from a cashback card. But we always took the perspective of those, those things are luxuries that we probably wouldn't have bought anyway, like really nice hotel rooms or first class plane tickets or access to lounges in the air, airport, airport. Mm -hmm. right? So we didn't care about any of that stuff. We really just focused on cash back that we could invest and then we could spend frugally on our form of travel like staying six months and renting an apartment and buying a car on Craigslist. Can't buy a car with credit cards. Staying points. in a camper van, like doing all those things. You can't do those with travel points. And you actually come out way ahead just investing the cash from the cashback cards and traveling frugally. So in our more recent years, yes, we've definitely signed up for like a few of the like uh, airline hotel or cards, hotel card, mostly hotel cards and, and cashed in on some of those. But honestly, it hasn't been a huge part of our travel strategy. It's It's really all been about just frugal travel um, in, in using hacks to make travel cheaper by mostly by staying longer, going on longer vacations. So to get back to that Australia trip that you asked about from last year, that was a three month trip, which means it was worth it to us to again do the car buying strategy. When we got to Australia, didn't rent a car, we bought a car um and we drove that thing for for uh three yes. months across the entire continent and back <laughs> and then we ended up selling it back just on facebook marketplace for more than we paid for it so we had a, a negative cost of uh transportation we made money on our transportation costs um, on that trip we did stay in hotels mostly because hotels in australia are just a lot more reasonable reasonably priced than in the u.s we probably paid for like maybe a week's worth of hotels with points or something like that. But the rest of them, we just paid for in cash. Um, and yeah, because of our freelance work that we continue to do um, just a little bit on that trip, because of the profit from the car, because of the fact that the trip was done very frugally, and because of our investment gains, now that we have a portfolio that's, you know, a mil million dollar portfolio, we came back from the Australia trip with $26,000 more net worth than the day we went on the trip. So it's gotten to a point now, 
a lot because of the investment snowballing and all that stuff that when we take a vacation, we're making money while we're on vacation. It's just crazy. It's it's like we can go infinite now. We could be on vacation all the time if we wanted to be. And one of the things too that you didn't mention that was part of what added to our ability to come back from that Australia trip and even a better financial position than before is we've done this a few times. We rented out our house while we were gone. So we didn't just like let this paid off home sit vacant while we were gone. We actually received rent from it. So when, when we do a smaller trip, when it's only like a month and a half or two months, um, it's sometimes hard to like fill that that gap. But when it's three months or longer, it's pretty easy to like get someone who wants to stay somewhere for a certain amount of time. So like in Gainesville, we went on our um, seven month trip to all the national parks. Um, we had a renter for literally the whole seven months um, who was in there. Um, and then for our Australia trip, we had a couple who I think they only did two out of the three months, but um, while we were gone, but um, that was like a huge hack too, is, you know, most people have a house, a home when they go on vacation. And so if you can make use of that home, turn it into something that makes you money, then you're not paying double for, for lodging or housing when you're on vacation. In, in Hawaii, we didn't have to worry about that because our lease was up in Orlando and we simply moved to Hawaii and got a new lease. Um, but if you're going to maintain a home and go on vacation, like renting out that house cuts that cost significantly. Yeah. I mean, the two of you just demonstrate the power that you gain from taking extended trips versus the short trips because the short trips you know per per day are so expensive but if you can like do a three month or a six month or a seven month trip and do some strategic planning and strategy you know before you go on that trip you can literally you know just crush that daily cost so it's pretty incredible what you have, sure. have done again and again. Um, speaking of the money thing, um, I just want to uh, kind of double click on the whole like sweep away method slash like pay yourself last um, because that's actually very similar to how I think, um, but is it which is contrary to even most people that are on the financial independence journey. So could you kind of walk me through how you think about that and then how that affected your journey to financial independence. Yeah. So I think you're referencing like a, a blog post on our site that explains like how we handle budgeting. Um, we have actually never kept a budget of any kind, which is kind of like weird and like sacrilegious in the fire community, I guess. But we have never set limits for our spending in, in any way on ourselves. What we do is we just say, how do we spend our money efficiently, right? Like how much car do we need? How much house do we need? How do we eat, you know, food that we like inexpensively, you know, cook at home, shop at the gro shop at Walmart instead of the grocery store, or Costco or something like that, right? Just do things efficiently. And then however much that adds up to, whatever it is, that's your living expenses. For us, that varied between like eighteen to like twenty six thousand dollars a year, something like that, throughout our twenties. Um, and then all of the rest of your income is extra. What do you do with extra money? You invest it. You sweep all of that into investment accounts and just forget about it. Your wealth just grows. Why spend more when you make more, or um, you know, why waste money on things you don't need? when you could just invest that money and then just become free quicker. And so that's kind of what allowed us on salaries that are just regular five figure salaries to end up, you know, reaching this financial independence, million dollar portfolio uh, relatively early um, compared to, I guess, most people who have the same salaries as us. Yeah, that's the same. So I discovered, I like the way oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say that I, I like the way that you sometimes say it where like, when you set a certain goal, like a lot of people in the fire community set a uh, like 50%, like I'm going to save half my income. But like, if we had set that, we'd actually be saving less over the years because our savings rate was actually always above 50%. And so doing it like the sweep away method style, we put every like dollar that didn't get spent into savings and it ended up that we saved more or into investments. Um, then had we set a 
10, 25, 50%, you know, goal of, of savings. Right. If you set a savings rate percentage goal, then as your income increases, your spending automatically increases as well, even if it doesn't need to. For us, our spending stayed just about flat. And so as our uh, incomes went up, because we didn't track our spending or even think about it, we just spent what we needed to spend. It stayed about the same and our savings rate just skyrocketed over time as we got raises from you know, 40 to 50 to 70 to $90,000 a year. Yeah. So essentially I did something very similar when I discovered financial independence. So I was like really late to the game. Like I was <laughs> one of those people who uh, spent way more uh, than they made for most of his life up until around uh, 34 ish. And, but then when I s- understood the concept of financial independence. And I realized that like, if you can get your savings rate to a certain percentage, it basically shows you the speed at which you're moving to financial independence. So, you know, essentially, uh, if you can get it to like 65%, you got about a like 10 year journey, but if you can get it to 80 or 90%, like you're looking at like a two to four year journey. So even though I was super late to it, I was like, for me, the savings rate was the golden metric. So similar to you, I had no budget. My budget was like, how do I get my savings rate as high as possible while having as much fun and like being free and being like a frugal weirdo um, as possible. And that's what like got me to financial independence in about two to three years, even though I like discovered it super late. But I mean, I had some income, like I was in uncapped sales commission job. So I just went nuts, like trying to earn as much money as possible while keeping my living expenses, uh, not keeping them the same, but actually radically reducing them through, you know, ensuring like low, uh, cost of housing, sold my Range Rover, got a Prius, stopped going out to eat for like two plus years and only ate at home. So, but the same concept is, is like, instead of being like, oh, I want a 50% savings rate, which then means I got to work for, you know, 10 to 15 years instead being like, let me see how big of a savings rate I can be. And that's essentially my budget is like getting my savings rate as high as possible. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it feels like instead of feeling like you're depriving yourself, like setting a limit on your spending. Your spending is unlimited, right? But you have a motivation to want to keep it as low as possible because you get to save more and you get to see your wealth increase as a result of that. So it it, it makes you feel good about spending less instead of feeling like there's some hard cap, some calorie counting that you're kind of doing with your money, right? And uh, you know that just doesn't feel fun at all. Yeah, we track our net worth um, every month. And I feel like that was really encouraging. We were checking in and seeing this number grow, Um, not just like what we saved that month, but then how much that added overall to like our our goal. Um, I told Stephen, like, let's track this and like, let's see, you know, I want to see that change. I want to see the effect that we're having over time. And I think that that made like a huge difference too in our, us being on the same page about it. And that like, we both wanted to see that number increase and we both wanted to like, it was a tangible, it was like made, made the goal more tangible. We could see the effects of our choices so readily. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, when they set certain budgeting goals, it it does, it feels like, you know, maybe deprivation, but for this, we were like, wow, we didn't go out to eat. So like, look what we got to put into the savings, you know, by eating at home this month, we like save so much more or like, you know, I found a way to like eat, all my lunches at the office instead of going out off off campus like everyone else did to eat um uh, we had like a little modest kitchen and so i just made food and um heated stuff up and that's what i and so it was exciting to see like wow like look at this stuff tick down look at these numbers tick up and um it was just encouraging rather than feeling like a bad thing um and so yeah i think that was huge for us too was tracking that yeah 100 percent, and it's all mindset right because essentially you the two of you and 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 me when i had like my fi awakening it wasn't like i wasn't spending money 
I was literally spending like crazy on freedom. I was buying more and more shares of freedom every single month and just was like, oh, let me just like go to the like all you can eat buffet of freedom and just eat as much as possible every month up until I get to this point where like then all work is optional. And just having the mindset like that, hey, I'm actually buying my freedom. I'm spending my money every month on freedom is so much more accept exciting than you know the kind of deprivation mindset which is like oh i like i can't spend money on this or that because like i'm trying to stick to a budget for sure awesome cool so let's talk a little bit about where you're at now um and i want to talk about building a business from a position of financial independent strength which is essentially kind of what you are doing now. So tell us, you know, what is it that you're working on and like, how are you thinking about building a business in a different way than say, you know, somebody else may think about it? Yeah. Um, so we've kind of been going serially on these multi-month trips for the last like four or five years or so and kind of just relaxing and doing like a little bit of freelance work and stuff. But last year, a uh, friend of mine, a uh, friend of ours, visited our house. We went out for a beach walk, and he was like, hey, man, uh, he's, he's a former coworker of mine from, from previous employer. And so he was like, hey, you know, we've talked about so many times, like, you know, everybody who were, used to work at the company has talked about at some point, like, starting a business, doing, you know, uh, like a tutoring company or something like that. Like, would you want to do that with me? Like, we should, we should do that. Here's what the idea would look like. And it was so right timed because we had just got back from Australia. So we were feeling pretty good, pretty relaxed, pretty energized. <laughs> and he, that's when he like approached us about this. It was perfect timing for us to be like, you know, I think we do something like I, that. <laughs> I, I'd brushed him off a few times before about it. Like, yeah, yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I don't know. But I was feeling like really relaxed. I mean, we were both feeling like, yeah, like it's time to start a new project. So he kind of kind of got us hot on that, convinced us of it. And we, we pulled the trigger. So we got to work on this new company, uh, which we launched last year. It's called Cram Better. It's an online tutoring company for college students. Uh, basically focuses on like pre-meds, engineering students, anybody who has to take like hard math or science classes. Um, so, In the horrible auditoriums of 500 people where you get no personalized touch when it comes to not understanding or needing extra help. Um, a lot of times it's lacking in those huge, um, like weed out kind of classes. Exactly. And and so we started this business. It's just online only. It's at, at crambetter.com. And it's a subscription service where for 40 bucks a month, which is way less than anybody would ever think of paying for tutoring, right? One-on-one -on -one tutoring could be 40 bucks an hour for like an entry level tutor. Um, you know, you get access to like practice questions and reviews of the material that are like short, sweet, to the point, only the stuff that's going to be on the test for these college math and science classes. So that's kind of the, the idea of the business. And it's been cool, like you said, starting it from a position of financial independence, because, you know, back in the day when when we were thinking about tutoring businesses and talking about these types of ideas, we were always talking about, like, let's do uh, like an in-person tutoring business, like starting a tutoring center or giving, you know, little like auditorium reviews and stuff like that. And what we really were talking about without realizing it was just giving yourself another job, right? Um, we even would talk about stuff that we'd want to do. Like, what if we opened a bakery or, you know, uh, we like to play games. So like, what if we opened a game store? But like, all those things are just a job that you have to now be at yourself until you grow enough to have employees. And like, that's such a slog. Um, but we were like, we've, it's completely changed our perspective on like, being a small business and starting a company. <laughs> so I'm, our new perspective is like, well, we don't need the money from this business to live, right? Like we're obviously fine without the extra money. So why don't we take a shot at the type of business that um, 
doesn't become like this grindy everyday job that you have to go to and like whether you want to or not like you got to sit down and tutor students to say like I would never want that anymore for myself at this point in life so that's where we came up with this like online subscription model business and it's really cool because it ended up creating a new business where it's actually less expensive for the customer way less expensive for the customer than paying for like in-person tutoring and it's way better for me and for my business partner and for Lauren because we don't have to like show up to a physical location or you know do any of that stuff on a regular basis so being financially independent gives you this new perspective on like instead of designing a business around like how do I ring the cash register day one and get people to pay me it's like, how do I design a business that creates the life I want and we'll try it. And if it works well, that's great. That's fantastic. It's a win-win. And if it doesn't work, that's fine too. Cause like we're good money wise and we don't need the money anyway. So luckily this one has been working out really well for us so far. Um, and it's it, been, it was profitable the first semester. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we hit profitability already last year, the first year of business and it's, it's going well and it is, um, obviously shaping up to be something that can become very passive in the long run. There's a ton of upfront work. I don't want to like undersell that. Like yeah. it's been a lot of work. This year has been a lot. <laughs> I, I, I have been definitely working full time for myself for the last year. Um, but it's really and cool. And he's over it. He's definitely. <laughs> I'm over the full time part yeah. pretty quickly. But Luckily, because like you said, we built this business from like this position of financial independence, this position of strength, we've designed it in a way where it doesn't have to be like that in the long run. And we're getting to that point now where we can kind of take our foot off the gas on it and it, it should be able to kind of run itself pretty soon. Yeah. yeah. And I think our business partner too appreciates that perspective because I'm not sure that that was necessarily his thought process starting out. Um, and so it's been fun to be able to have these conversations with him and like talk him through like, well, what if like, what do you want it to look like? And why don't we make it that instead of, you know, what we think it needs to like, what most people think it needs to be or whatever. And so that's been an interesting journey as well. Yeah. I think the power of designing work around life first is so powerful and ultimately, I think what everyone wants, because, you know, I think especially people who reach financial independence, like we're driven people, like we don't get to financial independence, like being, you know, super lazy or undisciplined. Um, but uh, at some point, even after, you know, a six month sabbatical, you kind of like feel like you want to go be productive and create like a positive impact in the world. And if you can do it, you know, with uh, skill sets and subject matter that you're passionate about or interested in, it can be a way to serve, you know, humankind and the world and the people that, you know, f gives you even more freedom. And, you know, even like, I think the coolest thing about what you're doing is uh, two parts. One, that you're providing a service at an even lower cost than like what it would traditionally cost for these people to get the tutoring that they need to like ace these classes. And then Secondly, is if it doesn't make any money, which it already has, it's like you're just exactly where you were before and you tried something out and you learned a ton along the way. And that is like that skill set of like building a digital product, a digital, you know, subscription course is like something that is going to like just empower you to take your entrepreneurial journey in so many different directions. And you know, having the kind of like wisdom to be like, well, I want to make sure I don't design myself back into a 40 hour work week job. Yeah, definitely. And uh, look, I get the other perspective too. Like, uh, you know, when we were hustling hard, you know, every way we possibly could, um, I, I had my eyes focused, we had our eyes focused on like, how do we make a buck today? Right. And so we were doing little things that like ultimately are not scalable and, and can't become like a long term, like semi passive type of thing. Right. And that's great. And I would I would tell people do those things. Right. Especially in the early years, because they are going to make you money, which you can invest into assets that will make you more money. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like we don't have regrets about that. 
but it is cool that you can kind of take a moonshot at something that has the potential for even more and and not have any risk associated with it when you've already reached financial independence. So it's like this whole new perspective on work. Yeah. And I think, you know, for people who achieve financial independence, especially early, I think it's 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 a good um conversation that we're having because I think people, you know, oftentimes they think they're going to get to fi and like never work again, but then a lot of people realize they're like bored and depressed cuz they're not doing anything. Um, so if you can instead like identify like, Hey, what are some things, you know, that I could do that, you know, create, you know, more empowering business in the world for people that is fun for me to work on. Um, and you know, just understanding that like, yes, you can work your way to five by, you know, hustling for the buck in the beginning, but then as you get to financial independence, you can then like take entrepreneurship at your own pace in a way that like works really well for you. Yeah. And I mean, like I would also point out, you know, after financial independence, you don't have to start a business either. (laughs) You can do things that are interesting and fun to you and are productive and helpful to other people that don't really have any particular prospects to make money either. Like that, that was sort of the idea behind trip of a lifestyle behind our blog and our social media presence and stuff. It's all free. Like it's not meant to be like a money making business. It was, we don't sell anything. It was so. a way to just help people learn the stuff that changed our lives, you know? And so that's like kind of a way of giving back, but it is interesting to have this perspective switch where like now we, the, this, this new business does make money. And so you get a little more leeway when it comes to like marketing spend like we don't really there's no budget for our blog because it doesn't really make money it doesn't have like a return the same way that like a business does and so it's interesting to be able to like be more business minded about it um you know we were always employees this whole time our whole careers we were employees not that we weren't you know making impactful decisions but it's different when you get to be like an actual decision maker about what's going on what you spend money on as a business. Um, And so that I think has been like a fun change for us is like having actual say in what your company is doing. Um, And that, that feels different when it like is meant to make money and it is functioning more as a business. So, yeah, I mean, just another thing to try out, you know, when you reach financial independence is just like try some things that are like, I don't know, like giving back type stuff, helping other people. It doesn't, it doesn't have to make money. Making money business is cool too. I like both. Uh, <laughs> both of those things are awesome. Yeah. How long did it take you to build and get Cram Better launched? Um, let's see. So from the day of conceiving of the idea to the point where we were ready to sell our first product, I want to say that was probably four-ish months, something like that. And then our content library has been growing. The, the number of courses, college courses that we offer, has been growing each semester after that as we add more content. So we started selling as early as possible to like prove that there's demand for the product, that it doesn't need any kind of like crazy overhaul to make sure that's okay. And that um, was something, too, that we kind of picked up from, um, from Alan in the Rebel Business, Rebel Business School is the idea of like, do people want it? And like asking people to buy it as soon as possible to like prove that it's a viable, you know, venture. Um, and so we were still, Steven and our, and our business partner were still recording the content that they were selling because it was co- like, it was, you know, week to week going through the course. And so that's, that's how we were able to still sell it without having all of it you know, necessarily done. Um, That's part of the stress that has been existing the last Mm. year. But in terms of like building up the website, getting the, um, all the branding, all of the um, back end website stuff all created, like that didn't take as long, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, really this content. We were zero to selling in about four months and then it's just been growing the content library since then. I love it. Um, awesome. So as we start to land this ship, uh, I like to ask every guest, uh, to share a tip tool or strategy for one for fitness slash health, one for money 
and one for life. So I'll leave it up to you if you each want to answer or if you have a collective answer for each, um, but over over to either one of you. Well, I think for fitness, um, one of the things that has like been impactful for me this year, especially, um, was similar to like how you set goals with your money. And like we were talking how Steve and I track every month our net worth and it was impactful to see those changes. I think a lot of people, maybe they do set a goal, um, but it sometimes is hard to track that. Like if you track your fitness the same way that you track um, your money, for me, for example, like I can't do a pull up. I'm still working on it. (laughs) Um, But like going, when I go to the gym and I use the assisted pull up machine, seeing um, that that, uh, amount that is assisting me pulling that, you know, less and less every time, um, is been like really encouraging. Um, and the same is true if you're trying to lift weights as opposed to pulling them, um, going up in your weight over time, like getting, you know, progressing in your fitness goals and not just, you know, I know when it comes to losing weight, people have an easier time with the whole, like tracking, um, sometimes to, to a detriment, but just like your lifestyle of fitness, like we go on a walk every day and like knowing, how much we're walking and that we're walking. Like it feels now that we do it every day, it feels weird if it's absent, like if we're unable to walk because we're like somewhere else or not at home or whatever. Um, And so I I think like putting something that quantifies your movement, your fitness um, can help you stay on track with that and, and not like lose mobility and not lose strength over time. I love that. A lot of times with money, it's easy because you're like, oh, I want to accumulate 25 times my expenses, right? There's a real number, a real goal. But with fitness, it's like, I want to be healthy and strong. Like that's, (laughs) it's tough to track. It's tough to get motivated on that. So yeah, I'll I'll give you one for money. Uh, So we kind of touched on this a few times throughout the podcast, the car stuff, right? Um, So one of the only ways that we've been able to do this like buy a car and then end up selling it for more months later is because we have never bought a car or sold a car or traded in a car with a dealer. Um, So we've never used a car dealership for anything. Um, So when you cut out the profit margin of a middleman, a dealer who's between the buyer and the seller of the car, the ultimate, you know, first owner, second owner of the car, second owner, third owner of the car, you cut out these transaction costs. And so th- this process is much more efficient. So we have gotten all of our cars on Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. Um, and we've sold all of our cars in cash to just individual people on Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. And I think that we've had much more efficient and lower fee transactions bas- basically by doing that. And I guess for a third one, the like kind of overall life hack that has been huge for us um, over the years. And it's going to sound kind of silly, but just being nice um, is huge. Uh, It goes such a long way. Um, I can tell, I can't tell you how many times I've like interacted with someone in a customer service position, for example. um, And it's very evident that they're like having a bad day um, or just like a long day. Um, And just being nice because it doesn't cost you anything. immediately changes their day and like usually also their treatment of you um, as a result. And I just think that the more that you can be that, that light and be that, that kindness in the world, you directly affect other people's light and their kindness. And it's a multiplier and it's so huge. I mean, the number of times we've just like simply asked someone for help um, and then be completely willing to help us, um, because, you know, we've developed a niceness approach, um, or, or, is, is uh, huge. like on social media, you know, there's a lot of people who want to troll you and write really mean comments <laughs> about whatever and complain about your existence, right. Being like on social media. So, uh, when we get mean comments, I'm the designated mean comment deal with her person. <laughs> Uh, Mostly because I wouldn't, I don't want to see it. Um, It's me and I don't want to see it. (laughs) But we've developed a policy that we will never be mean back, no matter how mean someone is in in an online comment. So we will always respond with 
kindness, niceness, and trying to help them. So if someone says like, everything you said is a lie, it's impossible to save this kind of money in this economy, you guys are scammers and blah, 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 which happens all the time. We'll come back to them with like, hey, uh, I'm really sorry that like things aren't working out for you. Here are some things you could try that are real tangible things that would actually work and improve your life instead of trying to fight with them or argue with them. And it's crazy. I mean, uh, more than 50% of the time that doesn't work, right? They just continue They're to troll you or they give up. You, but... <laughs> but maybe 10% of the time, we've literally had trolls on our posts come back and apologize to us and say, hey... I'm sorry, I was having like a bad day yesterday. I don't know why I complained on your post like that, but you were really nice to me in response and what you said was really true. And I was like, dang, that's crazy. Like we took someone who- Hated who us. Was, literally <laughs> hated us and, and turned them into sometimes even a follower, which is crazy. So just be nice to people. I love it. Awesome. Well, Lauren, Steven, such a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, to the audience members, best place to find them on all the social media is Trip of a Lifestyle. Is that correct? On Instagram, TikTok, et cetera, as well as tripofalifestyle.com. Yeah, the only place is uh, X or Twitter is uh, TOA Lifestyle because there's ah. a character limit on us there. But yeah. Our, We're off by one. It's so annoying. <laughs> our, main, our main channel is just our website, tripofalifestyle.com. You can find everything there. Awesome. And if you're younger and going through college and you need help with your physics and science classes, crambetter.com. Um, thank you both so much for coming on the show. It's been a true pleasure. Thanks thank for having you. us. Thank you. We appreciate you. 